From bloated and tired to free and inspired, welcome to Free and Inspired Radio with Philip Watkins, your weekly dose of everything digestion and mental health related. We hope you enjoy this episode. Here is your host, Philip Watkins. Yes, yes. Hi there. Welcome to another episode of Free and Inspired Radio. I'm your host, a naturopathic practitioner, Philip Watkins, and I'm grateful to have you with us today. If you're new to the show, well, the title says it all. It's all about feeling free and inspired and exploring the many different avenues you can take to get there, whether it's deep dives on digestion and mental health solutions or guests who offer their own stories and answers. I hope I can be the type of guide you can rely on to unlock the agency you have to reach your own mental and physical competency. Let's get started with what's coming up on today's episode. Coming up on this week's show. Welcome, 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 Herbs and Spices episode 45 of Free and Inspired Radio. In this episode, we've got something a little close to my heart, in fact, we're looking at one of the most apparent representations of the connection between the brain, the gut and the immune system that I think is out there and that's neuroinflammation or brain inflammation. We're going to be looking at its symptoms, its causes and bring it all together as best we can to help you understand why it's so vital in the quality of your daily cognition and mental health conditions such as depression. So let's get started with what neuroinflammation is. By definition, neuroinflammation is a broad term for an inflammatory response in the brain or the spinal cord. I have a different name for it and I call it a hot brain and brain on fire, if you like. Now, one of the one of most people's first experiences of neuroinflammation is when they get the flu. When we get sick, the immune system uses inflammation to mobilize or activate its different components to respond to the infection. This activation is an essential key point. The inflammation is an integral part of helping our immune systems take action. So it's important, right? I just wanted to say that mainly because it seems in the modern day there is a preoccupation with anti everything and these binary responses such in the case such as in the case of our antibiotic overuse have landed us in some unexpected and unintended situations especially when it comes to antibiotic resistance but I'm getting distracted and I, maybe I actually have an inflamed brain who knows but When we get an infection like the flu, for example, the inflammation that is needed to signal an immune response can also affect the brain and the way we behave. This effect is called sickness behavior, and the symptoms of sickness behavior will sound all too familiar. Um, Little motivation to eat, fatigue, reduced interest in anything that's not rest and sinking into the couch are all synonymous with getting sick, right? But there are some mental symptoms too. For example, there's a lot of crossover between the symptoms of depression and sickness behavior. Some key similarities are a lack of motivation or apathy, an inability to feel joy, and the general desire to withdraw from the world. I think a more, you know, a little easier way of thinking about it, or at least the way I describe it to my patients, is that you're not about to go and write your life goals or your goals for the year when you've got the flu. You don't really feel like it, do you? So all three of these are signs of depressive behavior as well. So that's the apathy, inability to feel joy, and the desire to withdraw. They're all three of them just signs of depressive behavior as well as sickness behavior. But they also make sense when it comes to the brain and the immune system working together to try and get you to rest and recover from an infection. It's actually an adaptive response, right? But what if the way you feel mentally and emotionally when you have the flu doesn't get better alongside the infection? And in 1999, a psychobiologist named Raz Yamura, I hope I pronounced that correctly, I always kind of throw away the pronunciations of these names and I hope I get them correct, Raz Yamura, Uh, was one of the first to connect the immune response from infection, the inflammation it caused, and mental health, specifically in depression. And that was, I say he was one of the first. There was also a psychiatrist called Michael Mays, who I think in the 80s was also talking a lot about inflammation and depression. But initially, 
um, Raz Yumira was uh, looked at mice and he uh, found that mice who were injected with an inflammatory serum were less sensitive to pre- pleasurable things such as food and sex, which is once again talks about that, that withdrawal. Uh, when things get inflamed uh, in sickness behavior. It wasn't until 2006 that researchers showed activation of the immune system induced depressive-like behavior in mice independent of sickness. So once again, hey, we're talking about animal studies here, but this was 17 years ago. So although this research didn't translate into human studies until much later, it presented us with the first connection between the activation of the immune system both outside and inside the brain and different presentations of mental health. Fast forward 20 years or so and our understanding of neuroinflammation and how it affects us has undoubtedly evolved. It's possible now to identify potentially inflamed brain regions by looking at the presenting symptoms. For example, inflammation of the frontal lobe in the brain can affect your executive function or the skills you need to get through your day. There's actually a full podcast on how to unlock your executive function if you wish to look that up in the list of podcasts that we've done. I'm sorry, I don't know the episode there. But frontal lobe i.e. the front of your, you know, the front of your brain around your forehead. This is where we see people who get concussions, car accidents, they bump their head in the car or something like that. That's where the region of the brain can actually get inflamed on the basis of the injury. And we're going to talk more about traumatic brain injury in the second part of the show. So another recent example of how uh, in many of our minds is how COVID affected our sense of smell. One recent study connected this with the virus's ability to invade the brain and inflame the regions associated with our ability to smell. An important note on this study is that it's yet to be peer-reviewed at the time of putting this episode together, which means it may not be conclusive, but my hope in mentioning it is to build the connection between how neuroinflammation can cause symptoms with which we are familiar. And a really interesting example of this is actually within the clinic where I do have a set of questions that I ask people around their sense of smell because a lot of people, they're actually their smell and taste isn't as good as it used to be. Now, once again, this is a sign that those regions can be a little more inflamed. If you're curious as to the other regions and some of these other pointers, then you have regions of the brain that help you to come up with words, for example. And if you've listened to some of the other episodes of the show, you'll know that maybe my region of that... (laughs) the brain that helps me to be articulate can be inflamed as well but once again memory consolidation learning all of these things uh, look at different regions of the brain and if they are becoming affected maybe that's a sign that there's an inflammatory process going on specifically in that region. Now, neuroinflammation, to build on this, is closely related to a common symptom that a lot of people are going through, brain fog. And brain fog is a typical way of describing characteristics of poor cognition, such as difficulty concentrating, thinking, and communicating. Once again, post-pandemic, our understanding of brain fog has evolved as long-haul syndrome or long COVID has seen a significant increase in people experiencing symptoms such as memory impairment, difficulty finding words, dizziness, and visual and hearing problems, all things associated with neuroinflammation. And COVID and all of that side of things, definitely another episode at some stage, um, a small room. I'm actually hoping to get someone way smarter than me on COVID to interview around all of that. So stay tuned. Other mild to moderate neuroinflammatory symptoms are depression, sleepiness, fatigue, and an increased demand for sleep. So I've had some patients describe the last symptom as waking up after eight hours of sleep with a sensation of not having slept at all. Now, I guess the next question after going through these symptoms is how do you know if you have neuroinflammation? Well, we've touched on some of them, right? If you feel like your memory isn't as good as it used to be and you're too young for it to be you know, not optimal, but also if you have trouble finding your words or you know, your, um, your ability to 
start something and finish something. So there you go. There's me pausing, trying to find my words. Um, all of these can help you. But as part of my routine case taking in the clinic, I always inquire about energy and fatigue with a two-part question that you can use to help you using yes or no, no questions. So I hope this helps. The first part is whether or not you feel you have the capacity to run 400 meters. Often just a yes or a no. I mean, obviously fitness and injuries accounted for. The second part is how you would assess your capacity to read a 3,000 word article, the equivalent of a main feature in a magazine, for example. Interestingly, most people tend to be okay with part one, so they feel like they can run 400 meters, obviously, if they're you know, physically okay in, the, in that sense. However, part two about the 3,000 word article is often the question that ends with a resounding no. One patient recently said it's time out after the 149th word, so he's not getting very far. But he was, uh, it, it was something that immediately when I asked him, he knew the answer, and a lot of my patients are in the same boat where the thought of reading a long form article or being able to concentrate and attend for that long is is not happening and i wonder if that's you and if it is hey let's chat it's most likely that you're experiencing a moderate mild to moderate form of neuroinflammation if it is you an easy way to tell whether it's mild or moderate is if you feel you're getting some form of the symptoms we discussed earlier from sickness behavior syndrome so adding to the slow brain and the brain fog you also see a loss of appetite motivation and the withdrawal they're all critical along with difficulty starting and finishing things as i said that's the executive function now let's say you're thinking well maybe i do have this neuroinflammation what causes it well that is an excellent question and we're going to answer it straight after the break here on free and inspired radio we'll be back with more of episode 45 on neuroinflammation real soon to take a break. Are you enjoying this episode of Free and Inspired Radio? There's no better time to take back your personal health sovereignty. If you want to connect with more Free and Inspired episodes, simply subscribe to your favorite podcast platform or visit the website at www.philipwatkins.health for more information. Let's get back to the show. Yes, yes, welcome back to episode 45 of Free and Inspired Radio where we're looking at neuroinflammation, brain inflammation and how it might affect you and what you may need to know. So we've looked at some of the symptoms. Uh, Let's kick off this part of the show with how neuroinflammation is caused. So it's fair to say that you don't wake up one day just feeling all of these symptoms, right? It develops over time and someone call, some would actually call it a slow burn. There you go. A slow burn is almost a perfect way of articulating it as the inflammation in the brain can come from two sources. One source comes from the outside of the brain, from the peripheral immune system or within the brain after the internal immune system gets activated by something either crossing the blood-brain barrier or some form of trauma. Let's unpack both of causes just a little bit, and it can also help us understand how to solve neuroinflammation uh, by looking at one of the main outside the brain causes, the gut. Now, if you're familiar with Free and Inspire Radio, you know it's always about the connection between the brain and the gut as much as possible. Now, as I'm putting this together, I'm actually surprised it's taken so long to actually do an episode specifically about neuroinflammation. I have brought it up in different contexts a lot. But I think, as I mentioned in the intro, neuroinflammation is one of the prime examples of the intersection between the brain, the gut, and the immune system. And it's really all about lipopolysaccharides so we're going to talk about lipopolysaccharides and why they their presence coming from the digestion affects your brain so when it comes to the microbiota and the effect of bacterial colonies in the gut it's the byproducts or endotoxins that these bacteria that create that act that actively affect the brain these byproducts are called lipopolysaccharides or more affectionately known as lps now that's how we're going to refer to them 
Generally, the immune base lining on top of the gastrointestinal tract lining uh, protects the bloodstream from these endotoxins entering and causing trouble. So your immune system actually has a mucus layer on top of the lining of your digestive tract to protect the bloodstream from these LPS kind of getting in there. Unfortunately, we've found over the last decade or more of research that the lining between these bacterial colonies and the bloodstream can be leaky. So that barrier gets a bit leaky, gets inflamed, and all of a sudden these endotoxins are allowed to slip through the cracks and reach the sterile bloodstream, which immediately causes an immune response. Now, if you're new to this phenomenon, welcome to what is commonly called leaky gut or intestinal permeability in the science papers. Now, you can almost you can find almost every disease associated with leaky gut, and it's fair to say that natural and functional medicine has a particular fixation on its recovery. Still, if I was offered a, my point of view in this, most people are going to have some level of this permeability in their digestive systems. And if you've listened to the leaky gut episode, you would have heard that there isn't much research just yet on correcting leaky gut and then correcting a condition or problem. So we know that many people with different conditions, including mental health conditions, all have a leaky gut, but we don't know to the extent at which fixing the leaky gut actually helps the problem, or at least in papers, right, in journals, research, etc. Clinically, I think that's a done deal. You know, we fix people's digestions every day and we see the, the brain and energy and a whole bunch of stuff all improve all at once and, you know, it's quite lovely to see. But when we're talking about science, which is what we're a little bit about in the show, right, we're looking at journals, we're trying to get some certainty in what we're doing here, then there's a little bit of a way to go. Now, the problem begins with these LPS little critters uh, after gut infections like food poisoning, for example, where some invited guests come in and set up a community on the gut lining and begin to create more and more of these LPS endotoxins that then get into the bloodstream and travel around the body. Now, the reason why this is important to neuroinflammation is often a leaky gut can lead to a leaky brain. I'm just going to repeat that. A leaky gut can lead to a leaky brain. And we have one of the people I train under, Dartis Karazian, for the term leaky brain back almost a decade ago. Now, it can be a little intense and scary when I explain this to patients, but let me explain. The blood-brain barrier, or the triple B, but I'm going to call it the blood-brain barrier for this episode, is made of the same cells as the digestive lining that we've talked about. So this vulnerability means that under the right, or in this case wrong conditions, it can be just as vulnerable to the effects that cause the lining of the gut to become leaky. So sometimes there's inflammation, sometimes there's actually the bacteria themselves that can travel through the bloodstream, which is a little crazy, or it can be the LPS as well. So the leaky brain has worse consequences than leaky gut, unfortunately, because the brain obviously is such a sensitive place, but it's also because the immune system is extremely sensitive to LPS. Now, this sensitivity means that the inflammation it causes can be significantly higher when the two meet. Therefore, before even reaching the brain and causing inflammation, LPS can create a long-standing, low-grade inflammation across the body. So before it even reaches the brain, the body can be inflamed because of LPS, and that's a big deal, right? Outside of the neuroinflammatory picture that we're looking at in this episode, this low-grade chronic inflammation is the developmental cornerstone of the most prevalent illnesses that we've got globally. For example, we see neuroinflammation in metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, and cardiovascular disease, and this generally LPS is a big pillar or origin story of the inflammation that drives all of these conditions. So let's get back to LPS and the brain. When LPS causes its inflammatory response, so I'm just going to remind you if you've lost the track, LPS is the endotoxin that bacteria in the digestion kind of, you know, for want of a better way, poo out and they then travel from there. So if you're getting lost with what LPS is, it stands for lipopolysaccharides 
and they are the toxic byproduct of undesirable bacteria in your digestion. So just to recap, just make sure you're keeping up here. So when LPS causes its inflammatory response, this inflammation can travel back up the vagal nerve. So the vagal nerve connects your brain and your gut it's in one fashion or can affect things at the site of the blood brain barrier. Blah. Uh, there you go. How's that for neuroinflammation? Can't pronounce the alliteration blood brain barrier. So I'll repeat <laughs> the LPS can actually cause an inflammatory response that travels up to the brain through the vagal tree or the vagal nerve tree back to the brain, or it can affect things at the site of the blood brain barrier. So the LPS can affect the brain in two ways. Alzheimer's disease and stroke survivors see higher levels of LPS in, the, in their brains, with Alzheimer's disease patients seeing up to 5 to 10 times more bacteria than healthy brains, and that means a lot more LPS. So this is quite groundbreaking considering that, unfortunately, over the last three months, I think, I don't know the exact time frame, but there, the, there was a paper that came out that basically exposed another paper that had an origin story for Alzheimer's. So basically what we thought was the cause of Alzheimer's in the brain was actually a fraudulent study, can you believe? So now it seems to me that we're almost somewhat back to basics with Alzheimer's. And um, But in saying that, LPS does seem to be a very large contributive factor to it. Inflammation from outside the brain can cause issues, but then what happens when trauma is inside the brain? So let's look at the second cause of neuroinflammation here. An excellent example of when this trauma occurs is a concussion. To put how frequent this is in context, around 1.7 million ant people annually suffer from a traumatic brain injury or TBI in the US. What's even crazier is that the average age is between 15 and 19 in men and almost the same age up to 21 in women. And I'll tell you why that's important later. So gaining a lot of exposure to TBI, gaining a lot of exposure to its effects on rugby and contact sports players, obviously the NFL, I mean, there's a film called concussion tbis can occur from a punch to the face a car accident or an explosion in the case of the military and there's a huge amount of neuroinflammatory research in veterans and trying to help veterans from recovering from uh, infantry fire and these huge field cannons uh, and the way they've affected their brains. Now, to understand how these types of things can affect us from a neuroinflammatory point of view, we'll need to introduce a particular group of cells in the brain called neuroglia. So unbeknownst to most, including myself before I trained specifically in the treatment of neuroinflammation, these neuroglia cells comprise of around 90% of the brain depending on the region. So not 90% of the whole brain, but certain regions of the brain can have up to 90% glia uh, in contrast to neurons. So the, these glial cells are really important. Now, the function of the different glial cells is broadly to maintain balance within the brain. This balance includes blood flow and an appropriate immune response when necessary. For this episode of neuroinflammation, we want to focus on the neuroglia's immune portion, the microglial cells. Think of these cells as the maintenance crew of the brain. They regulate the development of the brain. They maintain the neural network so the neurons can fire properly. And they repair injury when necessary. So pretty important. The problems occur when these microglia get activated. So for example, in the case of a traumatic brain injury we touched on earlier, over time, as part of the aging process, the microglial, microglial cells remain primed and produce inflammation within the brain, affecting the neurons' ability to communicate with each other. Whilst in most cases the inflammation can turn off once the immune system is attended to the stimulus or insult, microglia have difficulty turning themselves off once they are activated, leading to accelerated aging of the brain in the process. So let me repeat, repeat that. Inflammation can turn off once the immune system has attended to the stimulus or insult. Microglia in the brain 
have difficulty turning themselves off once they are activated, leading to accelerated aging of the brain in the process. So as these microglia cells are left to continue to turn the volume up on inflammation, the brain slowly shows degenerative effects, such as the signs and symptoms above, but also in mental health, notably depression and anxiety. Now, I'm just going to, just as a quick side note, you may remember I mentioned the age group of the typical traumatic brain injury. So whether you're listening to this in Australia, the US or Hong Kong, so we've got the Rugby Sevens this weekend, hope everyone's having a great time. But rugby, right? No pads, concussions everywhere. And especially when you've got young guys and girls going in hard when they're young, indestructible, don't care if they're getting concussed. Now, that happens in American football as well, or NFL, excuse me, it's the way I refer to it. Uh, English football as well, because people are heading the ball, basically, and also Australian rules football as well. Now, the crazy thing is, is that the majority of people just think that concussion was part of their lives, either they were in a car accident when they were young, or they were you know, concussed when they were 16 or 17, or got in a fight when they were 18 or even younger. And then 15 years later, they're presenting in the clinic with depression. They're presenting in the clinic with you know poor cognition, and they don't know where it's come from. Now, remember that the microglial cells have difficulty turning themselves off, but not only that, is that once there's an initial trauma, the microglial system actually changes towards priming, and then that aging speeds up. So lots of room for research here. We still don't know this for sure, and I'm bringing together some things here of my own volition and I'm excited to see where the science goes. But interestingly, uh, to bring up depression in this sense, there's compelling evidence to suggest that the success of antidepressants uh, as medications such as SSRIs or SNRIs is actually largely down to their anti-inflammatory effects, particularly when it comes down to neuroinflammation. So it may have nothing to do with serotonin and dopamine and everything to do with the immune system's response in the brain, which I know a lot of other practitioners feel the same way. So the problem with all of this is that your brain doesn't have pain receptors like your elbow or your knee. That means when your brain is inflamed and these microglia are activated, you won't know it's occurring. Just like if you hit your elbow, you kind of know to guard it, right? You know it's sore, you guard it until the soreness disappears and that's often a form of feedback to help you to know when to look after something. This absence of feedback that the brain is inflamed is precisely why neurodegenerative diseases such as Alzheimer's disease and in fact multiple sclerosis as well creep up on us over time and they tend to just hit us when they're you know, too set in. So if you're suffering from brain fog, particularly post-COVID or from depression that doesn't seem to respond to the traditional treatments, attending or investigating neuroinflammation can be one of the best places to start. And you might actually find that some of the cognitive shortfalls that you're tolerating through your day just simply disappear and I see it a lot. And in fact, I got a nice email from a patient earlier this afternoon who was experiencing exactly that after just three days. Now, a small caveat here, we've gone through a lot of information on how the brain can get inflamed, but I've given you no advice or solutions on how to fix it. Don't worry, we're going to do a part two and that part two is going to be solutions and what to do about neuroinflammation from a natural medicine standpoint. So that'll be coming up in a few weeks. You won't have to wait too long and we'll be able to give, hopefully match this episode with that one and you can learn about how to solve some of these inflammatory and immune activations in your brain. Before we begin, oh sorry, before we begin, wow, I'm, am I just the key candidate for neuroinflammation this, this week? Before we finish this episode of Free and Inspired Radio. If you would love to hear more from me or get the word on new articles and podcasts and more, jump over to the website philipwatkins.health. You can also learn how to work with me if you want to work with me as a patient. You are able to get in touch through that website where you'll be either able to book locally if you're in Hong Kong or Asia 
or we can talk to you about how to organize a virtual appointment if you're anywhere else around the world. So you can also join our community via the newsletter and sign up on the homepage there where you will be able to get a free ebook on psychobiotics or probiotics and their effect on the brain. Your reviews on Apple Podcasts and Spotify help me get the word on the street. And if you're listening to this on YouTube, throw the video a like and subscribe to see when each new podcast is uploaded. I'm back on regular scheduled programming now, so you'll be able to get this on the weekends as usual. As always, I want to send out some shouts to the show, show listeners who do get this far. There is some of you uh, who even listen to the outro, so I'm, I'm really grateful. Uh, this show is about helping you to find the freedom to feel inspired again. And I hope this episode gets you one step closer. Until next week, don't forget to take care of yourself and those around you. And in next week's episode, we'll be looking at vitamin D and why it's important. Thank you for listening. This has been a long one. A lot of research went into this episode. So I hope you got some value out of it. And if you have anything to say, don't forget, leave a comment, a question, and I'll be happy to help where I can. But for this week, free and inspired Radio signing out. Have a good one. Bye. Oh my gosh, you made it to the end. This show is all about you, and we hope you finished this episode feeling one step closer to feeling free and inspired. We'll be back next week, but if you want to know more about Philip, please catch a digital flight to www.philipwatkins.health for further details about how we might be able to help. In the meantime, have a great morning, afternoon, or evening, and we'll see you for another episode next week.